Hey guys, I'm Raquel. Welcome to Aldersgate Church. Thank you for spending part of your week with us, especially if this is your first time here. If you're watching live, we would love for you to engage with one of our online hosts via the chat boxes. If you're watching on demand, feel free to connect with us at aldersgate.online slash connect. On our website, you can find places to request prayer and give your tithes and offerings. You can also find us on social media. To receive texts for important events and last minute updates, please text the word LOOP to 806-745-0595. In just a moment, our band will be out to lead us in a few songs, and then one of our pastors will share a message from our current teaching series. All together, we will be here for about an hour. Thanks again for being with us today. We believe you're here for a reason. God has something He wants to say specifically to you, wherever you are, and our hope is that today you will be encouraged to move closer to Him. God bless. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there's this dialogue, not monologue happening. So let's try it again. Uh, good morning. How am I going? Wow. See, now I feel like y'all are ready to have church. Hi, Michael. Hey, so we think, hi, mate. The people are talking. I just want to tell you hi. Okay. Hi, hi, mate. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Hey, we're so glad that you're here with us at Aldersgate this morning, and uh, we gather in the name of Jesus to worship Jesus and to praise his name, and we gather as a community uh, because God told us to love God and to love people well, and so we want to put our minds and our attention on that, and obviously we find ourselves in a very peculiar world. We find ourselves in a world uh, that every day seems like it's changing, and every day seems like there's some different facet or some different thing that seems uh, that it's asking us to do a certain thing or not to do a certain thing. And uh, we as a staff have found ourselves in a very peculiar situation when it comes to where we are right now in our day and age, uh, because the state of Texas has mandated uh, that all people should, when they go out in public, wear a mask, while at the same time saying that churches are exempt from that rule. Uh, and it puts us in a very hard position. We've had people who have reached out to us uh, this week as a staff who have said they will not come back in the building uh, unless we require everyone to wear a mask. We've also had people who have reached out to us this week saying they will not come back in the building because we're asking people to wear a mask. And it puts us in this very hard position in leadership to try to seek after the Lord's wisdom when it comes to what we should and shouldn't do. But regardless of where you fit on the spectrum of the mask wearing, here's what I wanna ask you this morning. Whether you're here in person, whether you're at home, I wanna encourage you to take all of the things of this world and set those things aside and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and allow that to be your focus as we worship, as we learn, as we listen this morning to what God through the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. And in that place, let him soften all of our hearts to be able to step forward into decisions. We as a staff are continuing to seek wisdom from the Lord and how to move forward in our day and age. And I wanna encourage you to do the same thing, to seek the Lord, to seek Jesus, this morning and allow that to be the lens by which you see the world around you. So God, we just pray this morning that you would come, that your spirit would fill this place, would, spill, would fill every home that is being uh, shown this on their TV screens, on their iPads, on their phones. God, for the, the prisons uh, and the people who are going to be watching online uh, through that avenue, God, that, that your spirit will fill all of those places. And in this moment, we will fix our eyes on you and allow you to be the one who softens our hearts to conversations, that softens our hearts to the ways in which we move forward during a day and age that we've never experienced before. God, help us be a people who pursue you who love you and allow that love to transcend how we love people. God, be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go to God and worship. I was buried beneath my shame. could carry that kind of weight. You 
it was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my For you 
have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my Healing. 
I think 2020 is teaching us a lesson. 2020 is probably God's invitation for us to lament. This Christian right here does a really good job of, of um, fancying up prayers. Oh, dear Lord, thank you very much. You're so, so good, and you're so, so kind. Yada, yada, yada. Does God hear that prayer? Absolutely, he does. But does God hear the prayer that says, uh, God, 2020 stinks. I don't like this. I don't like the division. I don't like the hate. I don't like the unkindness. I don't like it. God, are you going to do something about this? Are you going to get off your throne and do something? And I think when God hears that, not I think, I believe. I fully believe he says, yes, give me more. Give me more. Tell me more. Tell me the desires of your heart. Tell me. Because I want to experience you just as much as you want to experience me. All of us in here have head knowledge. All of us have head knowledge about Scripture. We have heart. We feel God's heart too. But the question is, do we experience Him at a relational level where there's equity in the relationship and we can talk to God with whatever we want to talk to Him about? Psalm 4, the beginning of Psalm 4 is David saying, Answer me when I call to you. Answer me. Jesus in the same lineage as David. And David gives us permission to pray with lament. He gives us permission to pray with lament. So I'll say it again, God. 2020 stinks. 2020 stinks. But we know, we know that you are good. And when we don't know that, and we don't feel that, and we don't experience that, let us have the willingness to be willing the willingness to be willing to experience that he is good we invite him to be the king of our hearts the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song as you are good Your name. 
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Here we go. You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Cause you are good You're good Father God, we just thank you that in the midst of all of the chaos that surrounds us, in the midst of all the things that we look around and we see in our world that feel like everything is crumbling, everything uh, that we thought we were standing on doesn't feel like it's stable, that God, in the midst of all of those things, we can still in this moment, in this place, wherever we are right now, we can say that you are good. And God, we proclaim that that in the midst of, of difficult times, frustration, uh, anger, heartache, hurts, that God, part of our foundation of our belief in Jesus is that in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that storm, in the midst of that frustration, that you are still good. And God, help us believe that. Help us truly embrace that foundational truth that regardless of what we're struggling with, dealing with, frustrated with, hurting, that you are good. That God, it doesn't matter with the, the racial unrest in our country, with the frustration with the pandemic, with disease and sickness that seems to be everywhere around us. That God, in this moment, we can raise our eyes to heaven and we can say, God, you are good. And no matter what happens in life, I will proclaim that forever and ever and ever that you are good. So God, help us be a people this morning that are willing to open our hearts to the goodness of God, to listen, to learn, and be able to walk away from this morning, from this experience, changed by your goodness and for your glory. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat.
Good morning. How are y'all doing today? So apparently last service I forgot to introduce myself, so y'all get to hear my name this time. Um, so hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm an owner here at Aldrew Skate, um, and so I have the privilege of sharing uh, the message this morning. So Ryan asked me a couple months ago, I think, if I would preach this morning, and so he said, hey, whatever you want to talk about. I mean, you pick the topic, whatever you want to talk about. If you need some help, let me know. I was kind of struggling. I wasn't sure. So I said, hey, can you point me in a direction? He said, you know, Core 52, we just finished that message up, has a, a week that talks about faith. I thought it was pretty good. I read through that. Maybe talk about that. I said, okay. So I started looking through the book, start praying through it and thinking through, okay, what would that look like? I was like, okay, this is good. I'll preach on faith. You know, that sounds great. Then about two weeks ago, um, I'm in, laying in bed, whole house asleep. My brain will not shut off. So I pull my phone out and typed out on my phone with my thumbs the outline for this morning. So decided instead of going with faith, I'd pick a very simple, easy topic that we talk about every day, reconciling the races. Because, I mean, don't you just normally have that conversation just daily, Right? I mean, recently we're having that conversation a lot more. So, you know, I thought I'd pick just an easy topic to talk about. So if you've been around this church at all, you may have figured out um, that I am slightly exuberant in my worship. Thank you. Uh, so I grew up in a charismatic background. So for this morning, we're in a charismatic church. So you can, there we go. Okay, a few people got it. If you haven't been in a charismatic church, you may be like, what is this guy talking about? If you've been in a charismatic church, it's okay to say amen. It's okay to say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's okay to clap. It's okay to shout. So feel free to do that this morning. I was going to add the other part, and I'll, I'll add this. We'll see how this goes. Uh, growing up in Virginia, uh, my uh, grandparents went to small black Baptist churches. And I di couldn't figure this out until I was younger, but some of the, the mothers of the church would say, Lord, help them. <laughs> and, and I never figured out as a kid, I didn't know what that meant, but I was like, oh, he ain't doing so good, and they want God to help him. <laughs> so if you think I need that, then I know I need to keep moving or something. I don't know, but... So to this morning, I'm going to tell my story. Um, I think it's important for us to know people's stories, to understand people's stories. As we know stories, hear people's stories, we're able to understand why they make the decisions that they make. We're able to understand how they handle certain things that happen in their lives, as well as have a better understanding of how they'll make decisions in the future. And so I'm going to share a little bit of my story this morning with y'all and just be vulnerable and just let you know what my life has been like. So I'm the oldest of three boys. Um, grew up in a home uh, where thankfully both of my parents were active. They worked a lot. Um, they both worked full time to take care of us and take care of our family. And so my parents grew up in the civil rights era, uh, grew up um, in segregated schools and so in segregated areas. And so that was their life experience. You know, I mean, that's what they knew. That's what they grew up with. And so because of that, with me and my brothers, unintentionally, kind of the perception that we got is people that are different colors, it's okay to talk to them, but you got to keep them at arm's length. And the reason we got that is because my parents had been betrayed by people that were different colors. They had been stabbed in the back. They had been had their confidence betrayed, and so it was always... It's okay to be friendly to them, but keep them at arm's length. Don't let them get too close, because they'll betray you. That was the perception that I was given growing up. My parents uh, raised us in Richmond, Virginia, which at that point was 70% black. And so the school that I went to was mostly black. The church we went to was mostly black. And so I was around black people all the time. I mean, I just was. You know, that's where you're at. And there's some towns in West Texas that are all white. And it's, you're around white people. Like, that's just what it is. It's fine. We're not making judgment calls this morning. 
But one of the things my parents did, um, which I thought was a little crazy, is they moved us from Richmond, Virginia, out to the suburbs. And so I go from predominantly black Richmond to the suburbs where all of a sudden I'm the minority. Now, I know that racially speaking across the country, blacks are minority. I knew that, like as a kid, we studied that in history books, but it's different when your life experience and where you're at is different than the rest of the world. And so just culturally and everything else, it was different for me. And so we moved out there and all of a sudden, I'm the only black guy around. I mean, there's a handful of us, but there's not many. And so I remember folks coming up to me and saying, hey, have you met uh, Susan yet? You know, she's got uh, brown, hat, brown hair and uh, blue eyes and wears glasses. And I'd be like, I don't know. I'm not sure if I've met her or not. I, I really don't remember. And the reason I said that is because at that point, all white people looked alike to me. <laughs> I hadn't been exposed, exposed to people that were white other than the couple kids in my class in my school in Richmond. So all white people looked alike to me. So I couldn't tell Susan from a Betty, from a Laura, from a anybody. Like, I couldn't tell the difference. And so I was so confused. They're asking me if somebody looks different. I'm like, I don't know. Y'all all look the same. So when I hear somebody say, all black people look alike, all Hispanic people look alike, all Asian people look alike, I don't get offended, because if you're not exposed to people that look different than you, then yes, you see all people of one race as the same, as alike, as looking alike. You're not able to see the uniqueness in each individual and how God has created each person unique. So one of the things I think is important as we talk about this topic, is making sure we're all on the same page. And so I've got three definitions I want us to talk through this morning, because it helps. We can use these words um, that are thrown out, racism, prejudice, discrimination, but we all have in our head what we think that word means. And so then we hear someone else say that word, and we're, this person thinks it means this thing, this person thinks it means this way, and you're talking at each other, I almost said at each other, not with each other, talking at each other and just butting heads because you're not on the same page. And so I want us to make sure we're on the same page. So we're just going to jump in and define some of these tough words that we talk about. Racism. Start with an easy one, right? It's a belief or doctrine that inherent differences among the various human racial groups determine cultural or individual achievement usually involving the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right to dominate others, or that a particular racial group is inferior to the others. It's a policy system of government based upon or fostering such a doctrine, discrimination, hatred or intolerance of another race or other races. So if you want to look towards an example of racism, we've got a pretty big one from the history books, and that's Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. I mean, if you want an example of racism, that's it. Because what did he say? Is the Aryan race is superior to all other races. So that's the reason that Jews were put into concentration camps, because they weren't part of the superior race. I mean, that is a very blatant evidence example of racism. Prejudice. It's an unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand or without knowledge, thought, or reason. Any preconceived opinion or feeling, either favorable or unfavorable, unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially of a hostile nature regarding an ethnic, racial, social, or religious group. So I got to admit something. When I started off in my eighth grade year at that new school, I was prejudiced against white people. I saw all white people as being one group, as being one people. I didn't see the uniqueness. I didn't see the differences. I wasn't hostile towards them, but I saw them all as being the same. So Ryan and I um, have talked a little bit about race and racism and just some of the cultural issues um, over the last few weeks. And one of the questions he asked me is, do I think that most of the issues we're having now, is it being taught 
or is it things that are uh, not taught? And so kind of the hidden racism. And I had to think about that one for a little bit. Um, one, I believe, unfortunately, there are people that are still teaching their kids to hate folks that look different than them. And so until people stop doing that, we're going to keep having this same cycle of racism repeat itself. The same cycle of history that keeps coming back, keeps coming back, keeps coming back until we as a people decide we're not going to teach our kids to hate. We're not going to teach our kids to judge people based on the color of their skin. But there's also so many times that, and I'm talking to the parents in the room, that we as parents, as mentors, as leaders, that people are watching us and watching how we act and behave and treat people who are different. And so there may not be anything you say to somebody about people that are different, but by what you've done or not done, you've implied this is how we treat people that look like them. This is how we treat people that are like that. So one of my favorite photos um, that I have is actually taken in this room. And so it was, I think, last year um, at one of our services. Um, it was a Good Friday or um, I don't remember which service we were having, but we were having a worship night singing, music, and everything else. And so I am there, and like I said, I'm exuberant my worship. So I raise my hands a lot. Um, I'll yell and scream during worship. And so it was one of those times I had my hands raised, my eyes closed, worshiping God. I didn't realize until probably a couple weeks later when that photo showed up that my daughter was watching me. And so you see in the photo that she had her hand raised, watching me, looking at me for my example. Did I tell her to raise her hands? No. Did I tell her, hey, they're going to take a photo, so make sure this looks really good, you know? Get my good side, you know? Instagram fa fathers, you know? I mean, I didn't tell her that. Like, I wasn't trying to do that, but she's watching my example. So she saw what I was doing and said, oh, this is how we worship God. This is what we do when we're singing songs about God. This is what we do when we're singing songs about Jesus. This is who we are. So the people that you're in charge of, that God has placed you in charge of, that you're influencing, are watching you. They're watching how you interact with people who are different. They're watching how you behavior of people who are different, who look different, who act different than you. And discrimination. So discrimination is an act or intense or instance of discriminating or of making a distinction. Treatment or consideration of or making a distinction in favor of or against a person or thing based on the group, class, or category to which that person or thing belongs rather than on individual merit. So many times are you lumping people into a group and you're making judgments based off of what you see on social media, which if you're making judgments off of what you see on social media, please stop. Like we're, I'm not here to talk about social media, but I'm going to say this one thing. Unfortunately, a lot of what we're seeing on social media is people covering their ears and yelling at each other, not listening. So don't make your judgments on a people group based off what you see on social media, what you see on the news. If you're making judgments on people, make it off the individual person that you've talked to, you've met, you've had conversations with, not based on what you see in the news, not based on what you see in the movies, not based on what you see on social media. Make those judgments on an individual basis. Because guess what? There's good and bad people of all colors. Oh, somebody didn't hear that. There's good and bad people of all colors. So just because of the color of somebody's skin doesn't mean that person is a good or a bad person. It's their character that tells us. It's the things that they speak out of their mouth, the way that they act. That's how we know the type of person they are. 
So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was um, enacted 26 years before I was born. So I was born in 1980, if you're trying to do the math. And so 26 years before I was born, and so my perception was, okay, you know, mom and dad, y'all went through all that, y'all saw the marches and were part of uh, segregated schools and stuff, but that's not me. Like, that was all past, it's all legal, like, I'm not in segregated schools, I'm not having to be bused anywhere, like, that's not me. And so I don't have to worry about that, right? I mean, that's what I thought. And then I started having experiences. I was probably 12 years old the first time this happened. I was being followed in the store. And so you think, okay, how do you know you're being followed? Like, seriously? Well, when you see the same person that's in the aisle that you're in, who's working there, you go to another aisle, they're in that aisle with you again, then you go to another aisle and they're still there, you're probably being followed. Unless they just happen to be magically stocking something with invisible hands and invisible product, you're being followed. And so then my head starts going and processing, why are they following me? Did I do something to make them think I'm going to steal something? Did I say something? Like, what am I doing to make them think that I'm untrustworthy, to make them think I'm a thief? And so what did I start doing? Because this kept happening is I'd walk in a store. Here's the display. I'm going to stand this far from the display. I'm not going to get too close to it. If there's a product, I'm going to grab the product like this. Look at it. Set it back. If my hands go in my pocket and I've got a product, it's going to stay up here. Other hand will go in the pocket. So they don't think I'm trying to steal something. Don't think I'm trying to hide things. Those are the changes I started making on how I behaved in the store. And there's still things I do now unconsciously because I had to learn that apparently people are making judgments on me based on the color of my skin. So those are changes I had to make. Another story happened uh, in when I was 14, 15-year-old kid. So 1994, 1995, I was working at Chick-fil-A, which I love Chick-fil-A. Um, Great food. So one of those places I worked at fast food, and I still like eating there because I know it's all good stuff. Uh, and so working at Chick-fil-A, and it was one of those nights, if you've ever worked in retail or food services, I mean, you get those nights that it is dead. I mean, there is no one there, no one's coming, and you're just bored out of your mind. I mean, you're like, God, how long will I be here? You look at your watch, and you're like, it's been five minutes. Like, seriously, it's been five minutes. Sorry, Siri just activated and was trying to set a timer. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> but it's been five minutes. You're like, this night is going to go on forever. It was one of those nights. And so we're all cleaning um, the whole store, everything. And so I'm cleaning because I was 14. I couldn't cook. So I'm not in the back area cleaning the cooking area. I'm out front cleaning around the um, front of the registers. And so the front part of the registers and the front counterpart People would put their chewed up gum on the little brass and on the wood and trim and all the stuff there. Which, if you've ever done that, please stop. There's some person that's working there that has to clean that stuff up. It's not fun or funny, okay? So I'm having to clean all this stuff. So I'm wearing gloves and I got my little plastic knife and trying to scrape the gum off into a napkin or paper towel or cup. I don't remember how I was cleaning it up. So I'm doing this and I'm working my way down. Well, there's a lady that comes up to order. And so she comes up uh, to place an order. And so in my head, you know, I'm all about customer service. And so I thought, I'm not going to make her move. I'll move. I'll walk around her and I'll just come back to where she's at. Good customer service skills, you know, take care of your customer, make sure they're treated right. And so I get a little bit closer to her. Well, then she backs up. And so, you know, social distancing right now would be at least six feet away. She was like eight feet back. So she backs way up, and I thought, well, that's odd, but okay, whatever. So I clean in that area and just go past her real quick and don't think anything else about it. So I go to the back, get all my supplies so I could finish cleaning out front, throw all the gum away, and then realized that while I was in the back, she leaned over to my coworker 
and said, what's that N-word doing here? So 14, 15 years old. I don't know if they put the photo up of me at 14 or not, but skinny, scrawny kid. Yes, that was me. All whopping 150 pounds of me. So that, that kid, two years younger than that, is who apparently she thought was a stupid, ignorant person. I thought I was past that. I thought those were things from my parents' age. I didn't think that would happen to me. It hurt. It hurt for someone who didn't know me to call me names. It hurt for someone to judge me based on the color of my skin. Another story to share which happened, fast forward, to 2000. I'm in college. And so just 20 years ago now. And so I was part of, did summer missions uh, with campus ministry. It was a Baptist campus ministry. And so they had us traveling all over the state of Virginia doing college ministry. And so we'd go to two state, excuse me, two churches a week throughout this for about 10 weeks. And before that, we were doing training ahead of time. And so we learned all of our songs, our dramas, um, everything, all the skits, all the fun stuff we got to do throughout the summer. And one of the things they did was a photo shoot, which I'd never had a photo shoot before. So I thought, that's kind of fun. You know, I mean, I had like my senior photos from high school, but this is like a legit photo shoot. And they were going to print up flyers of our picture on it. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, I don't know if anybody said like a picture, like a flyer with their photo on it, but I was like, this is like, feels like, I'm like a star, an artist or something. I was like, this is kind of cool. And so they take our photos and they send it out to all these churches all over the state that had already registered and requested for a team to come. That way they could promote it, hang it up in their church, put in their bulletins, whatever. Hey, we've got a worship team coming. They'll be here these dates. You know, it'll be great. Well, we're four weeks or so into uh, the 10-week experience and we get a call from the gentleman that was head of college ministry for the state of Virginia. So he called and said, hey, I need y'all to come to my office here in a couple days when you're back in the Richmond area. I thought, okay, well, that's weird. I don't know, you know, did somebody get in trouble? Did we fill out like the reimbursement paperwork wrong or something? Like what's going on? You know, something seems odd. I like the guy, I like talking to him. So I thought it could just be he wants to chat with us and see how our summer's going. So we go in there, and he tells us, hey, I'm changing your schedule for the summer, and we're moving you to a different church that you had on your um, schedule for the summer. I'm like, okay, you know. So when we sent out the flyers to all these churches, I got a phone call from a church in southwest Virginia that said they weren't sure if they were okay having a black person in their church. 20 years ago. So they had to decide as a church board and vote on whether or not to bring it to the rest of the church, and then they had to vote on whether or not I was allowed to step foot in their church. So Tad was very wise, uh, who was head of the association of the state, and he was not sending us there. He had already made arrangements for us to go to a different church. He didn't want us to go somewhere or be somewhere where our safety could be compromised. And so he was very wise about that. But he did not tell the church that because he wanted the church to wrestle with that and figure out where in the Bible do they see that God is a God of one race? Where in the Bible do they see that you're not allowed to have anybody that's a different race in your church? in your church. So let's be followers of Christ, seeking after Jesus Christ, and called to go to all people, but you don't want somebody that's a different color coming in your church. Does that sound a little backwards to anybody else? A little odd? I mean, it did to me at 20. 
Like, I, I couldn't quite grasp that or figure that one out. But see, unfortunately, that is still happening today. That's still happening today in our churches. But it doesn't have to happen. It should not be happening in our churches. See, we as a church, we're called to be better. We are called to lead forward and lead the culture. We're not supposed to be trailing the culture and running after trying to catch up and figure out what's going on. We, the people of Christ, the body of Christ, should be the ones following forward, leading forward, calling for change. We are serving the almighty God. And we can't change the world around us? No, we're called to be different. We're called to move forward. We're called to lead forward as a people. We can do that. We have to do that. We have to move forward in action and do what God has called us to do. So you may be wondering, all right, you shared your stories, but I only trust what's in the Bible. Oh, good, I've got scripture for you too. Let's start at Genesis, start at the beginning. Chapter 18, read in, uh, we'll start at verse 17, but a little background on this passage. So Abraham and Sarah were there Um, together. And two men, we found out later they were angels, came to talk to Abraham. And they tell Abraham that when we come back next year at this time, Sarah, your wife, is going to be pregnant with a kid. And so at this point, they're old. I mean, they've been trying for a long time to have a kid, and they couldn't have a kid. I mean, she could not get pregnant. Like, no matter what they did, like, it didn't work. And so they're old, so they're like, we're way past childbearing years. Like, This ain't going to happen. But the angel comes and says, no, you're going to have a kid. And she laughs. And so then we go to down to verse 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may, may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So God was blessing Abraham that all nations might be blessed through him. Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equality and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. It says, let all the peoples praise you. Not just the people that look like me praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. Let's go see what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, listen up. I'm about to tell you something important. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus even tells the disciples, he tells us to go forward into all nations, baptizing. He didn't say, don't go to those people over there because we don't like them. Jesus called the disciples, calls us to go forward to all nations, tell all people about Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God's given all of us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world back to God, bringing the world back to God. See, you notice with these passages that even though God came, sent his son on the, um, when God sent his son Jesus to die for us, he sent him for all peoples, for all nations, all people groups. The nation of Israel was created so that God may bless all the nations through them. It was not an exclusivity thing. God was not trying to create a private country club. God wanted all peoples to be reconciled to him. So I'm going to challenge you this morning. I've got a challenge for all of you. And it's to move out of our comfort zones. It's to do some things that may be a little uncomfortable, may be a little different for you. I want you to have conversations with someone who looks different than you. So have a conversation with someone who looks different than you. And I want you to do a few things while you're having those conversations. The first thing I want you to do is to pray. Because if we're not seeking God first in all we do, if we're not seeking God first in our conversations that we're having with people, our hearts won't be changed. Because see, the mess that we're in right now can only be changed through the hand of God. It can only be changed by people that are seeking after God for God to radically change this world. And after you pray, I want you to listen to each other. So listening can be a hard thing to understand. I've got four kids, so understand that's a hard thing to communicate. But listening means that someone speaks. You don't think about what you want to say. You don't think about the next thing that you're hoping to do. You don't think about, man, you want to grab a cup of coffee. You're not on your phone while you're talking to them. You're actively participating in the conversation. You listen to their words, process what they're going to say, Ask them a question back back about what they're saying to show that you're listening. So listen to each other. And I want you to have an open heart. Sometimes there's things that we want to talk about, feel like we need to talk about, but we close ourselves off because we're worried about getting hurt. And I'm not going to promise you won't get hurt through this, But I do believe that the God we serve is bigger than any hurt that you may feel temporarily. And I want you to ask the tough, sometimes awkward questions. I mean, have you ever had a question in your mind? You've always wanted to ask somebody of a different race, different color, like, why do you do this? Or why do you always say this thing? Ask those questions. It's okay. Like sometimes we're just trying to figure out what's going on or why things are happening. You may learn, well, it's a cultural thing or I did this because my parents did this because my grandparents did this. It's just my family does this or I'm from Virginia. And well, sometimes Virginians are weird compared to Texans apparently. And so take the time to ask those questions. And then here's the important part. Continue to have the conversations. Because the changes are going to happen just having one conversation. It's going to be multiple conversations happening as God works on our hearts. As God breaks our hearts to be more like his, which breaks for the nations. See, God cares about all of us. He doesn't care about your color. He doesn't care how much money you've got in the bank account. He doesn't care about your gender. 
He loves you because you're his child. And he's created each of us to be unique. He's created each of us to be special, to be different. So we need to embrace the uniqueness that God has made us and learn to love each other. Father, we are so grateful for you. We're a grateful people who know you've called us together. You've called us as a people. You've called us as followers of Christ to change the world. As we seek to love those who look different than us. As we seek to understand those who look different than us. Let our hearts be like your heart. Let us see the uniqueness in each person that you've created. But let our hearts be broken for the nations as we reach out to all the peoples, all people groups, all those around us. So Father, we're asking for our hearts to be changed, for you to do a work in us as we seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen.
won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Here we go, church. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall. steadfast spirit within us. Create a clean heart, O oh God. Create in us a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Let that be our prayer this morning. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Hey everyone, my name is Evan and here are a few things to keep in mind for the weeks ahead. Today we've started opening up the kids area and hope to have it completely open by August 2nd. We're opening the area in phases to allow our volunteers, workers, and kids to practice new procedures we are implementing to keep everyone safe. Visit our website to find out when your kids can visit before we're completely open on August 2nd. Lastly, we hope you can join us for our summer movie nights July 22nd, 29th, and August 5th. Pack up the family and join us drive-in movie style in the church parking lot. We'll provide snacks and the big screen. Movies will start promptly at 9 p.m. We'll see you soon. Here at Aldersgate Kids, we have several opportunities for families and kids to get involved and dive deeper into their faith. Two of the biggest ways we do this is through our annual kids camp in BBS. Each of these events provide kids with the opportunity to learn more about Jesus and how we can participate in His story. These events supplement the teaching and worship we experience on a Sunday morning all throughout the year. When you get to Aldersgate, you are helping children go to camp, inviting people from the community to participate in VBS, and assisting the children's ministry in raising up kids to have an unshakable faith. We so appreciate your continued support, prayer, and investment into the lives of each child who interacts with Aldersgate Church. Thank you, we couldn't do it without you. Children's ministry activities coming up this summer, and so we've got Emily, our children's pastor, up with, here with us this morning, and so she's going to tell us a little bit about VBS. VBS is going to look a little different than it normally does, so Emily, tell us a little bit about what VBS looks like and what they need to expect when it comes to VBS. Yeah, so VBS is going to be totally different this year as we are doing VBS completely virtually and at home. So the way it works is you register for a kit and you log on to our YouTube page at 6 p.m. starting tomorrow and you do VBS with your family um, in your home or with a group of people. That way we can all have the same amount of fun. 
Yeah, and so obviously some people have already been registered and picked up their bags, but if they haven't done that yet, what do they do? So if you haven't registered yet, there's still plenty of time. You just go online to the website, aldersgate.online slash VBS, register, and then you can grab a kit. We have a table set up right outside, or you can swing by tomorrow morning and pick one up so that you're ready to go tomorrow. And so obviously we've got some parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles that are going to be helping with VBS mm -hmm. uh, at their homes. What encouragement would you offer them when it comes to doing VBS at home online? So the biggest thing I would tell all of you is if you're going to do VBS, plan to do it to the fullest. If you participate the fullest, your kids will participate to the fullest, and you will have the best time. So all the activities are laid out for you. The videos walk you through everything. But the more that you're in it and the bigger that you make it, the more you're going to get out of it. Awesome, awesome. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Emily or go to our website to get all the details for VBS this year online. If you're here with us this morning and you brought your tithes and offerings, you're going to have an opportunity on the way out to drop that into a basket. Or uh, you can always give online at aldersgate.online slash give. Uh, but we're so glad that you're here with us in person or joining us online. Uh, we're glad that you've decided to come and uh, join us as we worship Jesus. And we just pray that as you leave today, uh, that you look for opportunities to have conversations. Uh, look for ways to engage with the world around you in a way that maybe may make you feel uncomfortable or awkward, uh, but is something that is life transformational towards your future. Thank you guys for being with us this morning. Uh, you are dismissed. We are going to dismiss uh, in sections again if you've been with us. So we're going to go ahead and invite this section over here to head on out. Back.